So in the paper, I, I put forward a debunking argument against what I call the species' belief. And that is the belief that humans count more than other animals. So in other words, according to this belief, our interests, our well-being, our suffering are more important than the interest, the well-being, and the suffering of non-human animals from the moral point of view. So accordingly, if we had to inflict a certain amount of pain, either to a human or to a pig, uh, then we should inflict it on the pig, because human suffering is so much more important than the suffering of a pig from the ethical point of view. So in other words, according to this belief, uh, human, be human beings have a superior uh, moral status. And I call this belief the species' belief, uh, because it's structurally similar to other forms of uh, discriminatory beliefs that are more uh, familiar. For example, it's very similar to what we could call the racist belief. It is the belief that white people count more than people of color. And the main difference really is that in our case, the boundary is not race, the boundary is uh, species. So this species belief is both widespread and philosophically important. So many people intuitively believe that animals count less than humans. And this is evidenced by research in social psychology, but it's also super intuitive. Um, people tend to treat animals in all sorts of ways in which they would never treat human beings. Uh, for example, they eat meat, they are not opposed to research on animals, but of course they do not eat human meat. Uh, they would be very much opposed to research conducted on humans without their consent. Um, so now the fact that this species' belief is so widespread is important philosophically because many philosophers hold the view that we should try to accommodate widespread moral beliefs or widespread intuitive moral beliefs in particular. And as a result, many philosophers maintain that we should try to accommodate this uh, specific intuitive moral belief. Uh, uh, and, and this is what I want, to, uh, I want to reject in this talk. So I disagree with this. I think philosophers should not try to accommodate this specific widespread moral belief that uh, humans count more than other animals. And this will be my main claim in this talk. And my argument for this claim will be a debunking argument. So having said all that, uh, this will be the content of the talk. So first I will say a few words about the methods of ethics, and this will be a very general introduction to how to think about moral issues. Uh, second, I will show how this method applies to the uh, speciesism debate in particular. Uh, third, I will explain what debunking arguments are. So this is a very peculiar kind of argument uh, that are uh, very much used in ethics recently. Uh, and so we will see how these arguments work. Uh, and finally, I will present my debunking argument against this uh, speciesist belief. So let's start with a bit of method. <clears throat> in ethics, intuitions play a major role. And this is a crucial difference between ethics and science. A scientists rely on observations to test their hypotheses. And by contrast in ethics, we cannot rely on observations to test our hypotheses. Uh, what we rely on instead are moral intuitions. So it appears to us that such and such acts are right, such and such acts or types of acts are wrong. And this is the basic ingredient in our moral thinking. So just like observation is our best access to scientific truth and knowledge, it appears that moral intuition is our best access to ethical truth and knowledge. And indeed, the main method that philosophers use uh, to address moral questions is grounded in this very idea that intuitions provide us with an access to moral truth. And this method is called reflective equilibrium. So the method is very straightforward. First, we need to list our intuitive moral beliefs. So we list our intuitions on particular cases, for example, thought experiments, and also our intuitions on more general moral principles, including very fundamental moral principles. Second, once we've done that, we must detect possible inconsistencies. So 
So it's at this stage that we notice that some of these beliefs may be inconsistent, mutually inconsistent. And actually this happens most of the time. So most of the time, our intuitive beliefs about particular cases or thought experiments are incompatible with the principles that we intuitively accept. And so eventually these intuitions, these intuitive beliefs must be revised. So we need to modify our set of beliefs so that, they, so that it becomes coherent. And the idea is to balance our intuitions, to keep the strongest intuitions and to reject the weakest intuitions. So sometimes we will abandon uh, an intuitive moral principle, but on other occasions, we will rather abandon uh, an intuition on a, on a very specific case, for example, on a thought experiment. But in any case, once we've done that, we've achieved what we call a reflective equilibrium. So let's see how the method uh, is applied in the speciesism debate in particular. So first, we can list our intuitive beliefs that are relevant to the speciesism debate. So on the one hand, there is the speciesist belief that I talked about in the introduction. So most people have this strong intuition that humans count more than other animals. So in other words, uh, the interest, the well-being, the suffering of human beings matter more from the moral point of view than the, the similar interests, the well-being and the suffering of other animals. So humans have this higher moral status than other animals. But now if humans count more than other animals in this way, this must be because there is a morally relevant difference between humans and other animals. So there must be a difference between all humans on the one side and all non-humans on the other side that grounds the superior moral status of human beings. However, it would seem that per se, species membership is morally irrelevant. So morally speaking, uh, species membership seems to be the same kind of difference as race or skin color, if you will. So the fact that my skin is white rather than dark does not mean that my interests matter more than the interests of a black person. In the same way, the idea is the simple fact that I'm a member of the species Homo sapiens does not mean that my interests count more than the interests of, say, a chimpanzee or a dog. So if there's a relevant difference between humans and other animals, it's gonna be something else. It's gonna be something that has to do with the mental abilities of uh, humans and other animals. So at this point, we've completed the first step of the method. We have uh, two moral beliefs. Of course, I'm simplifying a little bit for the sake of presentation, but then we can move to the second step and so check for inconsistencies. So here the problem is that species membership appears to be the only difference between all humans and all non-humans. So this might sound weird at first, but because we often assume that there are many significant differences between humans and other animals, for example, uh, people are gonna say, well, uh, humans are more rational, self-conscious, capable of language, et cetera, et cetera, than other animals. But things are actually a little bit more complicated than that. So it may be true that these differences distinguish most humans from most non-humans, but they do not distinguish all humans from all non-humans. So for one thing, many animals possess at least some of these abilities to some extent. For example, chimpanzees, pigs, and crows are apparently self-conscious. But also some human beings lack these abilities either because they are too young, for example, uh, babies are not uh, rational, or because they have a mental disability. So some disabled people are not self-conscious or are incapable of language. So at the end of the day, it would seem that the only difference between all humans and all non-humans is membership in the human species. But then we have an inconsistency between these three propositions. So taken together, the three claims form a paradox. If species membership is the only difference between uh, humans and other animals, and this difference is morally irrelevant, and this means that there is no morally relevant difference between humans and other animals. And if that is the case, 
then it cannot be that humans count more than other animals. Humans cannot have a higher moral status because this would presuppose the existence of a morally relevant difference, and there is no such difference. So one of these three claims must be false, must be rejected. Now, since the third claim, the claim that species membership is the only difference between humans and non-humans, this is a non-moral observation. We can ignore it. This is not the kind of claim we could reject based on moral considerations. And so we are left with our two moral intuitions. On the one hand, humans count more than other animals. And on the other hand, species membership is morally irrelevant. So as we can assume that these moral intuitions are incompatible, we can then move to step three and we can put them in balance in order to reach a reflective equilibrium. So what's the strongest intuition? Which intuition should remain and which should vanish? This is the very subject of this crucial debate in animal ethics. And while a majority of animal ethicists reject the speciesist belief, so the first belief, there are exceptions. Some animal ethicists will rather reject the second belief, the belief that species membership is morally irrelevant. Now, I will argue that the speciesist belief, the belief that humans count more, is epistemically unjustified. And because it's epistemically unjustified, we should not include it in our reflective equilibrium. And in order to show that this belief is unjustified, I will rely on a debunking argument. So let's first see what debunking arguments are. So here's one of my beliefs. I believe that Montreal was once the capital of Canada. Now, this belief does not come from nowhere. It has a causal history. It is the effect of something that happened in the past. So there may be many different explanations, but suppose I believe that Montreal was once the capital of Canada because this is what I learned at school in a geography class. So in short, my belief that Montreal was once the capital of Canada was caused by the geography class. In this case, my belief is epistemically justified and it's epistemically justified because the geographic class is a relevant influence on my belief. It's a good influence on my belief. So why is the geographic class a relevant influence on my belief? Because it's reliable in the sense that it causes all sorts of true beliefs. So for example, the geographic class caused my belief that Ottawa is the current capital of Canada. It also caused my belief that Canada is a bilingual country. And it also calls my belief that Canada is um, north of the US. So the geographic class caused many true beliefs. Uh, and this means that my belief that Montreal was once the capital of Canada is shaped by a relevant influence. And so it's justified. So in short, this is a good case. Now let's consider a bad case. So suppose I find out the existence of a belief pill that causes random beliefs. And I also find out that I ingested this pill right before I formed the belief that Montreal was once the capital of Canada. So in short, my belief that Montreal was once the capital of Canada was actually caused by the random belief pill. In that case, my belief is epistemically unjustified. And it's unjustified because the belief pill is an irrelevant influence on my belief. So why is the belief pill an irrelevant influence on my belief? Because it's unreliable. So it causes all sorts of false beliefs. And this is very intuitive. If I ingest a random belief pill, I will start forming random beliefs. So I will start forming beliefs regardless of the fact of the matter. This means that maybe I will form some true beliefs accidentally, but I will also form many false beliefs. And so right there, we have a debunking argument against my belief that uh, Montreal was once the capital of Canada. So to put it most clearly, debunking arguments always have two components. The first component is a causal premise. Belief B is shaped by influence I. So in this case, my belief that Montreal was once the capital of Canada was caused 
or causally shaped by a random belief theory. And the second component is an epistemic premise. So influence I is a bad influence. It's an unreliable influence. So in this case, the ingestion of a belief field is an unreliable influence because it causes many false beliefs. And by combining these two premises, we can conclude that belief B is unjustified. And this is the case in particular of my belief that Montreal was once the capital of Canada in our little thought experiment. So at this point, it's very important to issue a note of caution. This argument does not show that my belief is false. My belief is true, or it is the case that Montreal was once the capital of Canada. What happened is that the random belief field accidentally caused a true belief. But because my belief is accidentally true in this sense, so because it's um, the result of an, an irrelevant, unreliable influence, it is nonetheless unjustified. So debunking arguments do not show that a belief is false. They only show that a belief is unjustified. And this is a very important distinction to which I will come back in the uh, conclusion. So having said all that, this is the kind of argument I want to use against the species' belief that humans count more than other animals. And this brings us to the final part of the presentation. So consider again the belief that humans count more. Just like my belief that Montreal was once the capital of Canada, just like all other beliefs, basically, this belief does not come from nowhere. It has a causal history. It's the effect of something else that happened in the past. And a plausible suggestion, I want to argue, is that this belief is causally shaped by tribalism. So this is the causal component of my debunking argument. Uh, so before proceeding with the rest of the argument, I, I'm going to say a few words about tribalism, um, because I assume that maybe some of you are not familiar with the, the notion. So, we all belong to a great variety of social groups, which we can call tribes. We are members of a university, we are supporters of a, a soccer team, we are speakers of a language, believers in a god, citizens of a country, etc., etc. And this variety of groups to which we belong leads us to frame our environment in a certain way. So naturally, we tend to divide our social world uh, between us and them. And we tend to favor us and to discriminate against them. So in other words, we are disposed to give special weight to the interest of in-group members and to discount the interest of out-group members. And this is what I call tribalism. So if we want to be a little bit more precise, tribalism uh, operates in three distinct steps. First, we detect salient groups in our social environment. So we sort out groupings that are socially relevant and groupings that are socially irrelevant. Once we've done that, we identify in-group and out-group members. So we classify individuals either in the groups to which we belong or out of the groups to which we belong. And we do so by relying on different markers of group membership. So there are many, many such markers Skin, skin color is an example, language is another, the clothing is yet another example. Uh, and all these cues uh, help us determine who belongs where, who's in and who's out. So they help us to distinguish us from them. And so once we've done that, uh, we can move to the, the final uh, stage, which is to discriminate against our group members. So we discriminate against them. And more importantly for our purposes, we form the moral beliefs that would justify this form of discrimination. So we start to believe that they count less than us, that we matter more than them. Now, three features of tribalism are worth, worth uh, noting at this point. First, tribalism appears to be a human universal. So it seems to be present in all cultures, and it seems to have been there for a very, very long time maybe something like uh, 50,000 50, uh, 50, uh, years or uh, 100,000 years, years. The second point is that the nature of the groups does not matter much. So no matter which social circle is salient in your circumstances, 
no matter which group you happen to think of as your group. The fact is, you will favor those who belong to your group as compared to those who do not belong to your group. And this has been observed in uh, different experimental settings. So even trivial ad hoc categorizations in these experiments lead people to discriminate against our group members. An example is the color, the color of your shirt. And so finally, the third point is that it seems that what matters really is intergroup differences. So it's not just that we care more about the interests uh, of our group members and the interests uh, of in-group members than the interests of our group members. What we care about really is the difference between our interests and their interests. So we're not just maximizing the welfare of our group, we are maximizing the difference between the welfare of our group and the welfare of the other groups. Okay, so now that we have a clearer idea of what tribalism is, uh, we can get back to the relation between tribalism and speciesism. So my claim here is that the belief that humans count more than other animals is largely due to our tribalistic psychology. So in order to see that, uh, we can think about the three steps of tribalism. So as we saw, the first step is to identify the salient groups in our social environment. Then we classify in-group and out-group members. And finally, we adopt distinct attitudes towards the two. So it's a striking fact that our relations with animals fit this pattern perfectly. So to begin with, the division between humans and other animals is highly salient in our environment. So it's a very common observation that we draw a sharp distinction between humans and other animals. And there is very strong evidence that this way of dividing our environment is both universal and innate. For example, in all cultures, young children believe that humans are not animals. And it takes a great deal of formal education to get them to change their minds. So to get them to accept that human, human beings are members of the animal kingdom. So interestingly, it's not just that children care about species differences per se, it's not just that they distinguish humans from chimpanzees as well as cats from dogs and cows from chickens. They mainly distinguish human beings from non-human animals. So it's not that much, so much species boundaries that matter. What matters is really whether an entity is human or not. So the, the boundary between humans and other animals is a very salient uh, boundary. Now moving to the second step, it's quite easy to uh, distinguish in-group members from out-group members when it comes to the human species. So there are many, many markers for membership in the human species. We have a specific size, a specific morphology. We work on our two feet. Uh, we talk articulate languages, wear clothing, etc. And of course, some human beings uh, are atypical in some of these respects. So some human beings have had a limb amputated. Some human beings are mute. Some human beings practice nudism. But the point is that we never meet an entity which as far as we can tell, might or might not be a human being, might or might not be a member of the human species. So at this stage, we have all the ingredients we need to move to the final step, the third step, and to start discriminating against animals and forming the belief that they count less than humans. And this is exactly what happens. So we discriminate against animals and we form the belief that uh, our interests matter much more than their interests. And so the speciesist belief that humans count more appears to be a clear instance of this psychology of us versus them this tribalistic psychology. And this confirms our causal claim. The species' belief is causally shaped by tribalism. Now, of course, this causal claim is not enough for our, our, our debunking argument. It must be combined with the epistemic claim. There are always two components to a debunking argument, the causal component and the epistemic component. So more precisely, this claim must be combined with the claim that tribalism is an irrelevant influence on the speciesist belief. So why is tribalism an irrelevant influence on the belief that humans count more? Well, the reason is that just like a, re a random 
belief pill. Tribalism is unreliable in the sense that it causes many, many false beliefs. So there are many examples, but the most telling examples are racist uh, beliefs. So earlier I explained that tribalism operates in three steps. First, detecting salient groups. Second, um, yeah, identifying uh, in-group and out-group members. And finally, discriminating against our group members and uh, forming the belief that they count less than in-group members. So as a matter of fact, we follow these three steps in our relations with other racial groups. So to begin with, race is among the most salient differences in the modern world. And this appears to be the case in all cultures and ages. And it begins very early in childhood. So even young children categorize people according to race, and what's interesting is that they do so even when their parents teach them not to do it. So in short, racial categorization looks like a human universal. And then, not so ra race is a salient uh, boundary. And then the, the second step is that to identify in-group and out-group members according to race. Uh, this is also something that people do. We sort out people uh, into different races. Um, so we use different markers to do that, uh, such as skin color, body shape, and hair type. Uh, and so there's also a lot of evidence that people do that. And then once we have done that, completed the first two steps, we can move to the third step and we can acquire distinct attitudes towards members of one's race and members, members of other races. And again, this is exactly what happens. Uh, there's overwhelming evidence that we tend to dehumanize members of other races. We tend to develop um, biases against them. We discriminate against them and we form the beliefs that would justify this kind of discrimination. So we form the belief that they count less. Then this shows that tribalism generates many false beliefs. So on the one hand, it generates many non-moral beliefs about other races that are false. For example, a white employer will uh, falsely believe that this black applicant is less qualified than this uh, white applicant. And on the other hand, tribalism also generates a bunch of false moral beliefs. So while most people do not readily recognize that uh, they believe that black people matter less than white people, for example, some, some people hold uh, such beliefs nonetheless. And in light of what I just said, it seems quite clear that their beliefs are largely due to tribalism. So tribalism causes many false non-moral and moral beliefs. And by contrast, it's much less clear that it leads us to form any, uh, or at least many true beliefs. So overall tribalism seems to cause many more false beliefs than true beliefs. And this makes it an irrelevant influence on our beliefs. So to sum things up, here's our debunking argument. First, the species' belief is shaped by tribalism. This is our causal premise. Second, tribalism is a bad influence. It's an irrelevant influence. And this is our epistemic premise. Conclusion, the species' belief is unjustified. Now, as I said before, this, is, this does not mean that the species' belief is false. It might be unjustified, but true. It might be accidentally true, just like my belief that Montreal was once the capital of Canada. But this result, that this belief is unjustified, is already very interesting. And so by way of conclusion, uh, I would like to explain very briefly why I think it's interesting. So let me explain what all this implies for the speciesism debate. So you will remember that the speciesism debate is essentially a battle between two intuitive moral beliefs. First, humans count more than animals. This is the speciesist belief. And second, species membership is morally irrelevant. But now we know that the first belief, the speciesist belief is unjustified. And this is interesting because if an intuitive belief is unjustified, then presumably we should not include it in our reflective equilibrium. We should not try to accommodate it. So we can set aside the belief that humans count more than other animals. And this leaves us with one moral belief, 
the belief that species membership is morally irrelevant. It's not the kind of difference that could justify a special consideration or a higher moral status. And so now you will remember that I also talked about another uh, belief earlier in the talk. Species membership is the only difference between all humans on the one side and all non-humans on the other side. So there are many other differences between most humans and most non-humans, but these other differences do not separate all humans from all non-humans. And now if we combine these two claims, we get the following conclusion. Humans do not count more than other animals. So in other words, speciesism is wrong. We should give as much consideration to the interests of non-human animals as we do to the similar interests of humans. And this conclusion is a very substantial claim in the speciesism debate. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>